This is uh, Spotify Discover Weekly. If you use uh, Spotify, you'll probably know that once a week, Spotify sends a couple of dozen songs to your phone, um, and they appear as a playlist. Um, and when I talk to people about Spotify, this feature, Discover Weekly, is, is the thing that people call out as being the most delightful, the most enjoyable, the most surprising feature of Spotify. This is the reason that people tell me, I was going to ditch my subscription, but then I thought, well, I'll, I'll lose Discover Weekly. Um, and you know, that's an incredibly powerful feature. That, that is the moment of delight for Spotify. Everything else is kind of, you know, this is what I expect from the service, but this is where the delight comes. Um, and what about the design for that then? Well, you know, it just uses a playlist, like any other playlist on Spotify. So there's no new design going on here, because um, the really cool, interesting stuff, the thing that delivers the delight, the thing that sets this service apart, well, that's, that's the algorithm that sits underneath it. Um, that's the thing that the engineer wrote, that, uh, that, that decides what music should go into that playlist. And if, if you were the UX person working on Spotify Discover Weekly, the most delightful feature of Spotify, what would your contribution have been? Maybe it would have been this, a wireframe with, oh, put some stuff in here, please. <laughs> and the engineer is the person delivering the delight. Um, so, you know, What's happening then is the value may be shifting from all of that UX stuff into something completely different. Uh, and algorithms like this are changing more complicated interactions as well, taking away some, you know, the importance of some of the things that we've done. So over the years, a lot of people on my team have worked on interfaces like this. This is uh, the trend line. It's the, the UK's number one ticket for the rail ticket selling website. And we spent a lot of time over the years trying to figure out how to display the complex, confusing, often nonsensical world of UK travel ticket prices. UK train pricing is just bizarre. And trying to make that make sense to people on screen. Trying to make that make sense to people on a smaller and smaller and smaller screen as people started to demand that this stuff goes onto their phones. Um, well, that's a, a, a huge task for an information designer, for an interaction designer, and in the future, though, I wonder if we'll need that, because I think the future of this type of interface looks more like, more like this. You know, this is a, a chat interface, and when you think about the interactions that people are going through, this is a great way to answer the kind of questions that people have about their travel. Um, what's, what's more, you know, everyone uses chat. I mean, everybody uses chat. Everybody you see walking down the street doing that on their mobile phones is using a chat interface. There's no new interaction design required here. Instead, what it is, is it, everything is happening on, on the server side. Everything is happening under the, um, you know, under the wire. And if you think about it, there's no, there's no IA required to figure out how to display complex information on a small screen. It's all done in the back end. It's developers all the way down. And so nobody had to pull out Photoshop or Sketch, or Exure, to come up with an interface like this. So we don't need those. Maybe we don't need interaction designers. There's all sorts of places where algorithms are starting to crop up and starting to deliver really valuable services, the things that set tomorrow's services apart from today's. So people like Wells Fargo Bank are creating services that look inside your current account and offer information on how you could spend your money more wisely or how you could use their services more wisely. Um, Google now anticipates the user's needs. It'll look in your inbox, see that you've got uh, tickets to the cinema, notice that you're at work and the traffic's a bit heavy and say, hey, I think you need to leave a bit early to get there. Anticipating your needs. You don't even need to, to touch it and it's helping you out. Um, algorithms help you shortcut uh, input as well. So not only recognizing stuff on screen, but DeepMind, uh, stuff that bought by Google, is actually working on algorithms to allow you to figure out how many calories there are in the food that you photograph. That 
you think about how complex that task is on a health tracker, and how cool and easy that is, that, that incredible shortcut just makes the idea of, of suddenly tracking the amount of calories be so much easier. Um, and that need to shortcut user input is growing. It's, it's growing because the way that we access the internet is about to change. It's about to change because of the devices that we're, that we're starting to buy. If you look at um, what's happening, the growth of Internet of Things devices is, is, you know, is happening even as the growth of, of smartphones is stagnating. So tomorrow, it's perfectly legitimate to think, well, you know, maybe you'll be leaving your smartphone at home as an incumbent, and the computing will be done in the environment around you. I mean, tomorrow, I imagine, well, the process of buying a, a train ticket, you know, we've moved from buying a, a train ticket on your PC to buying and having the train ticket on your smartphone, a digital train ticket, to, well, what does the future look like? Surely the future looks like you just walk into the train station, the train station recognizes you, you get on the train, you get off, you get billed, and there's no interaction design at all. It just happened in the background. Um, Coordinating all of those devices is, uh, is something that, you know, it, you can't attach a, a touch screen to every single Internet of, of Things device in, in your house. It's just ridiculous. And so coordinating those devices starts again to be something that's done through algorithms interpreting voice input. So interfaces seem to be shrinking, disappearing, and, and maybe our roles are too. I've got a business of 50 people. Um, and I've got to wonder, how many designers are we going to need in the future? How many of those people's jobs are going to be disrupted by this sort of technology? And I guess you should be asking yourselves the same question. Um, is my job about to get disrupted? So, as I've been looking ahead to the future, uh, over the last year I've been talking to people who design these sorts of interfaces, getting involved in, in projects and designing these sorts of things myself to try and understand, well, well how are our roles going to shift and how are we going to need to pivot and what, what skills, what, what place do we have in that future? And I think, think the best way to, to answer that question is to think about what does it take to design a service that's based on these sorts of um, technologies. So let's imagine that we're designing for a bus company. The first thing you've got to ask yourself is, okay, well, where can we do something to help the user? Um, well, fortunately, her needs are pretty obvious. Um, she needs to know, where is my bus? Do you know it? Um, and, you know, so how can an algorithm help with that? Well, algorithms need data. And the first thing you've got to think about, if you're trying to put together a service that's, that's based on algorithms, is if you have a unique source of data, if you have a unique data set, you've got the opportunity to create a unique service. Otherwise, anything you've got is kind of copy of it. So anybody can access that data, anybody can, anybody can figure out how to do it. But if you've got a unique set of data, you can do something that's unique. So what data do we have? Well, if you think of the first layer of data that we've got, that's the bus timetable, right? That is where is the bus supposed to be? Um, well, that's, uh, that's not unique data, that's public data, and it's not even true. So, <laughs> What else do we have? Well, we do have some unique data. We've got GPS data. As the bus company, we have GPS data from the buses. So we can look back in history and say where the buses actually were at any one time, and whether a bus arrived on time or not, and, and, and when it got there. And that's all very interesting, but it's not terribly useful to our user. But what happens if we start to add in other layers of data? You, know, you, could, you could look at the weather. You could look at traffic patterns, you could look at where there were roadworks in town. And maybe as you start to sift through all of that data, you can find patterns, you can find correlations. And, and then you could say, well, are these things occurring now? And you could start to make a prediction. Is the bus going to be late? You could say, tomorrow, before the bus is even set out, your bus is going to be eight and a half minutes late. And that's a cool service. So, okay. The thing is, though, algorithms aren't magic. They are engineering. So once you've come up with an idea like this, somebody actually has to create it. And if you start coming up with stupid, crazy, impossible ideas, 
then you're just going to get a lot of angry engineers staring you down and have those embarrassing meetings. So you need to kind of know, well, what are the parameters for service like this? How do I talk to an engineering team and understand you know, whether an idea is feasible, what the shape of it is, how we can take the essence of that idea and turn it into a service? So here are the basics of that conversation. Um, you can break down the engineering task like this. Okay, you've got a set of inputs, those are our data layers, yeah? the bus timetable, the weather, school holidays, and so on. We've got the algorithm, the processes, the data, and we've got some outputs. In this case, whether or not the bus is going to be on time. So let's work backwards from the outputs. So as a designer, I guess the first thing you need to know is what kind of output is useful to the user. Uh, is it enough to say the bus will be late, the bus will be on time, that kind of binary output? Um, do you need to say, the bus is going to be more than five minutes late? That sounds a bit more useful. Um, do you need to give a, give a precise number? The bus is going to be eight and a half minutes late. The more detailed that output, the more complex the engineering task. So it's, it's important to know before you begin what the parameters of this thing are. And that's really where we come in, right? With Wizard of Oz um, prototyping, uh, with user research. Okay. Once you can say, okay, this is the sort of thing that's going to be useful to the user, this is going to be less useful but still of use, this is going to be completely pointless, let's not do it. That's really useful information. So begin with a Wizard of Oz prototyping. It's a quick way to knock down ideas. What about the algorithm that gets you there? Um, well, when you're developing a service like this, you start off with a, a raw algorithm and you train it to recognize situations to rec and make predictions. And you do that by giving it a sample set of inputs, that's the weather, that's the roadworks, and so on, and some known outputs. When did the bus actually arrive? And then the engineer adjusts the algorithm, trains it, uh, so that the outputs fit with the known inputs. There are lots of different classes of algorithm, support vector machines, decision trees, deep learning, dozens more. Picking one is the engineer's job. But the choice there really depends on the types of data, the types of relationship that you have. Um, I guess one way to begin that conversation, an important way, is with data visualization, starting to look at the data and think about well, where are the possible relationships? What, what does this data look like? Um, and what are the patterns that we need the, data, the, the uh, algorithm to be able to identify within that data? If you as a human can identify and articulate those patterns, you stand a chance of being able to assemble an algorithm that's going to be able to do the same. When you're thinking about the data, um, there are things you need to worry about. Quality, for instance. That GPS data we've got should be pretty accurate. But what if there's a, a blank spot in the middle of town, maybe some high buildings, and suddenly the GPS data isn't so accurate in that space? Um, well, then you've got noisy data. Um, and that can lead to overfitting that can lead to your algorithm making inaccurate predictions based on dodgy data. So your engineers want to know about quality, and you may need to clean the data. Um, if the data in each of those layers also is unnecessarily complex, then the algorithm may end up being slow. The algorithm may end up being unreliable. Um, so it's a good idea to examine what's in each data set and consider editing it to be simpler. That sounds a bit odd. You want to simplify the data down. But think about that weather data that we've got. Um, do you really need to know the temperature, or is precipitation really going to be the most important set of data? If you can get rid of the temperature data, you've narrowed the data set down. Do you need to know um, exactly when rain started and finished? Was it enough to know that it rained in each hour? Do you need to know about light rain, or is it only heavy rain that matters? Um, what you can start to do then is, is to narrow the information down that's in that data set. You make the data set lighter, and it actually makes it easier sometimes for the algorithm to identify patterns. If that sounds odd, think of looking at um, some you know, blurry text on a, on a, on a grey background and squinting your eyes or turning up the contrast on a, on a computer monitor so that the text appears more clear. And it's exactly the same for an algorithm. Sometimes coming down the amount of data can make what's important start to show through. Here's the thing, though. Predictions are never going to match reality. The point about a prediction is it's a guess, and any guess is going to be wrong sooner or later, no matter how hard you try. 
So you can't choose to be perfectly accurate, but what you can choose is how you want to be wrong. There's two types of wrong. There's high bias, which means that you know, you're, you're predictably wrong, in a, you're wrong in a predictable way. And there's high variance, which means that on average, you're right, but any one guess could be way off. And different applications require different types of wrongness. So if you're designing a fitness tracker, say, you don't need it to pick up every single step that you take. Some of those swings of the arm might correspond to steps. Some of those swings of the arm might just be you waving your arms around. So long as at the end of the day, on average, you've got it right. It doesn't matter. 10,000 steps. Whereas if you're designing uh, to see whether or not your bus is going to be on time, well, it kind of matters. If you say, hey, on average, I'm right, that's not going to instill a lot of confidence on people. It's better then to err on the side of saying, well, the bus is probably going to be on time. And at least that way nobody misses their bus, even if they have to wait a little longer. So you might not get the kind of spooky accuracy that you want, but, you, but at least you won't upset people. Um, at the end of all of that, what you should have then is a trained algorithm that's delivering the information that you want based on the data that you have. And now you can set your algorithm loose on some real data, see if it really works. Chances are, it won't. It still won't be accurate enough. Um, running a closed beta at this point, or a service with some kind of feedback loop is going to be necessary, because you know, it takes huge amounts of data to get this stuff right. Then your algorithm can then learn without the need for supervision from you feeding it training data. So think about that. We've built a prediction machine. And all the way through, if you think about it, there's a dialogue between the designer and the engineer about what's possible, about how you present it to the user. And I think that's a key to our future role. Um, you know, tools and, and APIs are proliferating, so maybe we'll be taking on the job of training algorithms in the next few years. There are incredible toolkits available from Google, from Facebook, from IBM. This is uh, Microsoft Azure Studio. Uh, if you want to, you know, if you go onto IBM Watson's website, there's a whole bunch of APIs that you can pick up and play with, and they're algorithms that are, you know, ready to do, ready to do specific types of job, and you can pick them up and start to think about services that you can build around them. So you can tinker with them, and you know, you, you know what? If you want open, you can go and look for open source stuff. If you want to create a facial recognition uh, engine. Well, there's at least half a dozen algorithms out there on GitHub that you can download and, and have a tinker with, and, and they're just your street to, to play with. But the real places that we have value is the other stuff. It's thinking about what the inputs are, what the outputs should be, uh, how they're presented to the user. And it's really easy to get that stuff wrong. It's been got wrong so many times before. Um, if you wrap up your recommendations in an interface that promises human-like interactions with human-like manners and, and abilities, and then it fails to deliver, people will revolt. The, the problem with Clippy is that you know, it looks like a person, so you kind of expect it to have that level of intelligence. And he's, he's hated because he's brash, he has no social intelligence, he has poor manners, he interrupts you while you're doing stuff in a way that you can't easily ignore. And having this thing interrupt you doesn't feel smart. It makes you feel stupid and patronized. Um, if there's a high chance that interruption is going to be unwanted, then you know, a quieter, humble approach is far better. So this is iOS Mail. And iOS Mail can see that I'm writing an email to David and Richard. And it knows that when I do that, I often want to send that email to Paul and Verity as well. And so the suggestions are there and they shortcut my input down to one click each, but I can ignore that easily. It's not in my face. It's, it's not doing the thing that, that Clippy was doing. And I think a, a lot of next generation interaction design really lies here, around the etiquette of suggestions and assistance. Etiquette occurs in something as simple as, as recommendations. So um, one client of mine, a, a supermarket, um, turned off their recommendations very quickly after putting them live um, because they just failed to get the, the etiquette. Um, so they found that people who bought nappies were also being recommended, and I spot the white wine. 
<laughs> when we need a quiet time. <laughs> um, and uh, perhaps more surprisingly, people who bought cucumbers um, also needed condoms. <laughs> I have no idea, but it's, it's probably safe. Um, <laughs> The, the point here is, you know, there is a statistical correlation, I'm sure, <laughs> between the two. You know, I'm sure that a lot of people who buy one thing also buy another, but there's no meaning and there's no social intelligence behind this. So, you know, the social intelligence side comes from, from knowing that, that products like alcohol and prophylactics have a kind of a, a, social, a heightened kind of social taboo around them, and you shouldn't just be linking them up with any old thing. You should be very careful about when you're making recommendations based on that. And, and even if there's a, a strong statistical correlation, I'm sure that a lot of people who buy strawberries also buy detergent. But it doesn't mean there's a meaningful relationship there. And it's the meaningful stuff that really matters to people. Um, so giving that sort of social intelligence is incredibly important. Um, perhaps more seriously, there's the problem of algorithmic cruelty. So I'm sure you've heard the story of Eric Mayer, um, the um, front-end developer, whose daughter died of leukemia. And at the end of the year, Facebook decided that it would be a great idea to give their members um, a little look back over what had happened to them in, uh, in that past year. So Eric Mayer's homepage popped up at the end of the year with a picture of his, of his dead daughter and it's saying, here are the great memories that you can relive. That's not algorithmic cruelty, though. Um, really, that's, that's the fault of the designers, the fault of the people who, who didn't think around the use cases, who just drew up a statistical uh, relationship and, and put it out there with no context, with no deeper thought about it. Um, so it's not the algorithm that didn't look at, you know, it, it was an algorithm that didn't look at the, at the content of what was being presented, make any kind of judgment about it. And, Building that sort of judgment into the systems that we create is, is our job. It's an interesting question about what about something like music that's created by algorithms. I'd say I would argue that there's still an author there somewhere. There's still somebody who designed the mind, the algorithm that creates the music. It's not that these things happen out of nowhere. People are putting this stuff together. And we have a great responsibility within that. If you're thinking about getting started with this stuff, you don't have to build something huge and complicated. In fact, it's probably better if you look for, for smaller moments to do this. This is a contact manager that I use, and it's a terrific moment of an algorithm, a very simple algorithm, presenting a, a small moment of delight. So in the contact manager, it, uh, it asks you for what is your next action and when do you want to complete it by. So, okay, I'm going to call Sarah to confirm the next steps. But if in that, um, if in that, uh, that note to myself, I include a date, call Sarah on Monday to confirm next steps, the algorithm notices that and pre-fills the date automatically and saves me a couple of clicks. And it's a very simple, neat little algorithm that just helps me to experiment with, okay, well, this is how we present these kinds of, um, you know, if you're, if you're trying to get to grips with the, with the um, uh, etiquette and the manners around making suggestions around leapfrogging user input. This is the kind of small moment of delight that you can start playing with. What about more complex situations like natural language interfaces? Well, you know, essentially natural language interfaces are just collections of algorithms. So the same sorts of rules apply. I mean, you need training data, like transcripts of conversations from, from a customer contact center. You're probably going to need to simplify that data set. So, for instance, looking for the conversations that get to uh, a satisfactory conclusion in the fewest number of steps. Um, you're going to have to remember that you'll, you'll approximate a conversation rather than create a thing that's perfect. So you need to flag that to the user as well. Uh, a friend of mine, a guy called Pete Trainer, uh, has just launched a chat service for a UK bank. And it deliberately refers to itself as we, not I. So that the user's constantly aware that they're not talking to a smart, intelligent human being. They're talking to a bot at the other end of it. Flagging that up feels a little like, oh, well, you know, maybe people wouldn't want to use the service. But that's the point. 
people should be able to drop out and talk to a human being whenever they want. In fact, when he, he uh, first created the service, about 70% of people went very rapidly to drop out and, and talk to a human being. But as he's tweaked it and tuned it and learned more about how it should act and behave, he's got that number down to about 30%. So doing the right thing um, doesn't mean that uh, nobody will use your service. You need to do the thing right if you want people to use your service. Um, you can help out women's finances by, by looking for meaning, by creating maps of concepts, um, in other words, ontologies, um, and using that to codify knowledge around a subject. Um, but it also helps to keep conversations simple uh, and to use, you know, to, to, to flag to users that they need to, they're talking in a stylized, simplified way. A great example of that was the adventure game Lost Pig came out a few years ago. You can download it and play it on your computer now. Um, and in Lost Pig, you had uh, an orc called Grunk who was looking for his pig. And you had to tell Grunk what to do. And because Grunk is an orc, you know that Grunk's going to have trouble with complicated language. So you know you have to keep your sentences simple. And you know that every so often Grunk is going to do the wrong thing. And you forgive him. What I love about that is, you know, it's, it's, it's got humor. It's, uh, it's, it's delightful, but it serves a, a proper engineering and interaction purpose. And flagging to people what's going on, whether in a funny way like that, or by getting your service to refer to itself in a, in a slightly strange way, just to let people know this is what's happening, is an important tool in our toolkit. Um, because interfaces aren't always as, as smart as we hope they could be. GL Gray Hot. D. Earl Grey Hart. Earl Grey. D. Earl Grey Hart. 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 <laughs> this is the Starship Enterprise, and it seems to have less kind of uh, natural language intelligence than an Amazon Echo. Um, yeah, the, if you're looking for, you know, the, it's a terrible way to interact with, uh, with a device. Making people act in a sort of formalized way is uh, incredibly demanding on them. Um, and you know, if you look at um, studies of, uh, of people using interfaces hands-free in cars, say, using something like, like Siri, which is actually quite demanding in the ways that you talk to Siri so that it understands you. You have to say its name before you, before you do anything. You have to ask it cer certain questions it gets, certain questions it doesn't get. And that extra leap of, oh, this is what I'm allowed to ask, this is the way I have to ask it, uh, means that Siri is actually almost as, um, as tricky to use as a touchscreen interface in a car. Um, so what you need to do is look for what are, the, what are the patterns that we see in people's natural conversations and learn from those. And there's a, a fantastic body of psychology out there that give you some great design rules that you should be building off of. And the first thing you notice when you start designing conversational interfaces is that you can't start with a blank screen. People have no idea what this thing can do. And if you try and start with a blank screen, you get one of two reactions. People either sit there and go, well, I don't know. Uh, or they go, hey, computer, uh, make me a sandwich and fly me to the moon. Um, you know, they either ask everything of it or nothing. Um, so you need to begin just by introducing yourself, just by saying, hi, this is who I am, this is what I'm here for. Uh, anchor the conversation. So make sure the user is set up on the path to success. Suggest something that they might do next, which will get a positive response. One of the complaints about bad conversation interfaces is that they're verbose. Um, when you look at what's successful about natural language interfaces, though, is, and when you look at uh, succinct conversations, human conversations, you see that they're based around common ground, around this idea of there's a shared context between the participants in the conversation. So if a chatbot knows your transaction history, then that transaction data can start to form part of the common ground. Uh, and you get incredibly efficient conversations like this. This is way easier than the normal returns process on a website. Um, 
And you know, my friend Pim Tran, again, he's been looking at, well, what about the issues about making payments in an online bank? Um, he's figured out that actually using a chatbot, if you're logged in, if it knows who you are, what you're trying to do, then you can make a payment in about a quarter of the time it takes for normal kind of film filling and tapping. That seems really odd. You go, well, look, there's an awful lot of typing to do. There is a lot of typing to do, but there's not so much thinking. What we're used to building is hierarchical menus. Essentially, you know, we're building Yahoo. Uh, we're building, you know, look at this menu, pick an option. Look at this menu, pick an option. Look at this menu, pick an option. That's what all those buttons on touch screens are. Um, and this is much more like Google. This is much more like, well, what would you like to do? Okay, let's get that for you. That random access, if you can leverage the intelligence behind it, is way more efficient. Um, here's another example of the psychology of conversations. Um, just because an answer is correct doesn't make it a good answer. If you're in a hurry, you really don't want to hear that. Um, the user is signaling something very, very important at the start of that conversation about the format of the answer that she needs. Um, and that's the same answer. <laughs> Um, with an appropriate level of detail. Um, humans operate on the principle of least collaborative effort. Because when you look at what's going on in the conversation, you realize that the two participants in the conversation are actually trying to minimize the joint effort. They're trying to minimize the overall effort in the conversation, not you know, one person is trying to minimize their effort. Each person is trying to think about, well, what does the other person know? How can I tune my questions and answers so that we get through this together. Because the conversation is a social interaction. That's how we're programmed, that's how we're tuned to, uh, to make conversations work. So you need to give your bot a theory of mind. You need to give your bot a sense of what could the other person be thinking, be feeling, be wanting from this conversation. And if you're designing for natural language interactions, you need to be able to pick up on those cues. It's all about evaluating the time pressure, the risk and the probability of error and the outcomes of error uh, and the shared knowledge and using that to kind of tune the conversation. So I've always looked for um, human conversation patterns to figure out how to solve interaction design problems. But now what I'm finding is that understanding human to human conversation is crucial to design knowledge. That's a core part of, of what I'm doing. So going back to the psychology of conversations turns out to be foundational knowledge that I need to rely on every day these days. What about Discover Weekly? Um, well, I spoke to Matthew Ogle at Spotify, uh, who was responsible for this. And it turns out that a large part of the design work here was about understanding how to package up this service. So they looked at other formats for delivering the service, but you know what? Playlist format was familiar. It was something they could take off the shelf, users understood what it was, and how to use it. When they spoke to people about what they wanted from a service like this, one of the things, you know, they asked people about, well, how do you discover music? And the sorts of things that they heard about were playlists sent from friends. And so they took that insight and unpacked it. They thought, well, you know what? We could design an algorithm that's going to send you a thousand songs every week, but that just feels inhuman. It feels robotic. And limiting that number to a couple of dozen made the service feel much more like a mixtape that had come from a friend. Um, they, they looked at the data visualization. They looked at people's, uh, uh, people's um, music catalogs. And when they did that, they saw that you know, people had genres that they tended to listen to. But you, know, you might have, over here, a little bubble of Disney music. And that, that wasn't because you wanted to listen to the tracks from Frozen. It's because you have kids. So that's music that you don't want to have recommended and pop up in your Discover Weekly playlist. And over here, you know, you had hip hop, which you only listen to at certain times of the week, and that's your running playlist. And you don't want that also in your Discover Weekly playlist. So by visualizing people's uh, music catalogs, they learn something about the structure of those and the sorts of things that the algorithm should be doing when it's predicting what people would like to hear. They also wanted to give it that kind of human feel. And so when Discover Weekly is looking for recommendations, it will promote tracks that have been shared by other human beings in their playlists. 
that pushes them up to the front because there's a sort of an indescribable quality about those tracks that makes them, you know, these are the sorts of things that people like. You can't put that in, in words. You can't find exactly what that is. But you know what? We can do something here to tweak the album and make the playlist, again, feel more human. And the result of all of that is that in the user research they did throughout the development of the service, people started feeding back to them exactly what they wanted to hear. People started saying, well, this is like a mixtape from a friend. If you think about that, you know, the, the engineers made the service robust. But the interaction designers made the service elegant and approachable. So our core skills are still important. And there's a rich future for interaction designers. But we have to evolve our practice and our knowledge to stay relevant. And that journey is just beginning. Thank you.